design rarely takes the spotlight in cinema, let alone stationary design. But in American Psycho, Patrick Bateman is a superficial, materialistic, bloodthirsty psychopath with extremely strong feelings about business cards. But does he know what he's talking about when it comes to design? In this video, I'm going to break down the details from a designer's perspective and take a look at what American Psycho got right and mostly wrong about business cards. Let's return some videotapes. Is that a gram? New card. What do you think? Whoa. Very nice. Look at that. Picked them up from the printers yesterday. Good coloring. That's bone. And the lettering is something called Cillian Rail. It's very cool. <laughs> okay, let's start with what's right. Uh, bone. Now, this is relatively believable. The material cards are printed on his cardstock, and it comes in many different shades of white. It can be down to the material it's made from, either paper or cotton, and the addition of brightening agents such as titanium dioxide. There are various numbered systems for precisely specifying different colored inks, uh, Pantone being the most famous, but there's no equivalent universal naming convention for whites. Uh, here are some various color options from Nina Paper and uh, G.F. Smith. Each supplier has their own name system uh, for these different shades, and Bone would totally fit right in, though in all likelihood the name would be probably used for something warmer, maybe a more yellow shade than the one he's referring to. The lettering, on the other hand, is not uh, silly and rail. No such font has ever existed. This is purely from the writer's imagination. It's a weird name. Uh, Cillian Rail would perhaps make sense for a railway company from Cilia, <laughs> like the name of uh, the type used by Transport for London is called Johnston Underground, but there is no place called Cilia, and uh, in any case, that style of lettering would probably be kind of wrong for an investment banker, like dressing in a set of overalls instead of a power suit. The font they've actually used is a version of Garamond, a family of many typefaces derived from the work of Claude Garamond, a 16th century French engraver. Garamond's what's called an old-style serif. It's very conservative and conformist, so it works perfectly well for this context. After too many hours of researching, trying to nail down the exact version of Garamond used, um, it's left me stumped. This font mystery has defeated me. Um, like Darwin's Finches or Ray's original pizzas in New York, there are just simply too many dozens upon dozens of variations. Uh, an article by Claire Green from 2018 suggested it to be Garamond Classico small cap by Linotype, but uh, the numeral 5 doesn't match, and the ampersand in that font is cap height, not X height, at least in the PostScript Type 1 version I was able to track down from 1994, which makes the strongest candidate chronologically. Uh, that article has lots of additional detail I won't be able to cover in uh, this video, so I've left a link in the description if you're interested in reading it. That aside, the first thing Bateman should have done when he picked up these cards from the printer is um, send them straight back, because there are multiple errors. Uh, firstly, acquisitions is misspelled, missing a C, as it is in all the cards in this clip. Also, the second space is missing from Pierce and Pierce. We'll talk about the layout, printing, and cardstock when we've seen the group as a whole. For now, let's keep watching. It's very cool, Bateman, but that's nothing. Look at this. That is really nice. Eggshell with Romalian type. What do you think? Nice. <laughs> okay, the eggshell color is very similar to Bateman's bone. What Van Patten is calling Romalian here is actually a version of Bedoni, which is categorized as a modern serif from the Didone family. You might recognize this style from the masthead of Vogue. Uh, a signature feature of this style of type is the high stroke contrast. That is, the greater the difference between thin and thick lines within the type, the higher the stroke contrast. Didone faces have been quite popular in the fashion world. It's very striking in uh, editorial use, and therefore it was used first by Harper's Bazaar, then Vogue, and then in turn by fashion labels such as Armani, Calvin Klein, Valentino, and Elizabeth Arden, amongst others. Um, they've all used this style of font as their brand typeface over the years, therefore 
It's not a font you'd associate automatically with investment banking, though plausibly in the late 1980s it could have just been on the right side of acceptably trendy. Jesus. That is really super. How do a nitwit like you get so tasteful? I can't believe that Bryce prefers Van Patten's card to mine. But wait, you ain't seen nothing yet. Raised lettering, pale nimbus, white. Impressive, very nice. Mm. Okay, so the screenplay makes it clear that pale nimbus white is supposed to be the color, not an imaginary font, followed by the color. Uh, the delivery is a little ambiguous. The lettering, however, is definitely not raised. Uh, in fact, looking closely, we can see the lettering is slightly debossed, the complete opposite of raised. Uh, we'll get to debossing later, but there are actually two ways to achieve raised lettering in the late 1980s. Uh, a third method, spot UV varnishing, has become more popular since the 2000s. The first more expensive and traditional way is called engraving or embossing, also die stamping, these are all the same term. This is done by etching a plate or die, uh, traditionally this was done by hand, but usually it's done at least partly by chemical process these days. Uh, the recesses of this die are filled with ink, then the paper is pressed against the die during the printing. Any part of the die which hasn't been etched will then crush down the fibers of the paper, flattening them and leaving behind a raised printed image. The second cheaper way is called thermography, in which a print is made conventionally, then an additional layer is printed and a powder of thermoplastic is added on top, which sticks to that layer. The powder is then melted to produce the raised effect. This is usually noticeably glossy and can be brittle as well. It's not particularly high fidelity, so it doesn't work for type at small point sizes. Not that Bryce has to worry about that since he didn't get either of those. Let's see Paul Allen's card. Ah, love the sound. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my god. It even has a watermark. <laughs> okay. So in the novel, we learn that Bateman, ever the poser, wears non-prescription lenses in his glasses. Uh, he might still want to get his vision checked though, since the watermark which he's worked himself into such a froth over is actually nowhere to be seen. Something wrong? Patrick? You're sweating. If we're being generous, we can say there are two kinds of watermark. The first is the boring one we see on screen, uh, such as used by stock images, which is just taking some text or an image and reducing the opacity. That's not in evidence here. Secondly, a true watermark, which works on a similar principle to embossing and debossing. Uh, before printing anything on the surface, the paper stock has to be completely wet. Then an image is pressed into the surface, crushing some of the paper fibers once dried, this leaves an image which can be seen when the sheet is held up to the light and uh, light passes through, except it only works when the paper is thin enough for light to pass through, which this card clearly isn't. Um, what we do see on the card is a typeface called Copperplate Gothic. Despite the name, it's categorically not a Gothic which is a subtype of sans serif font. Uh, this one is quite an unusual one. It's a display face of sorts. It has no lowercase alphabet and it has the tiniest little serifs. It works quite well in print and it's the font that makes the most sense thematically with the banking industry. It was very popular through the 20th century for professional services like banks and law firms, especially for signage and stationery. It's the same font that's used for the opening and closing titles of this film. It's waned in popularity in the 21st century, partly because it lacks a lowercase alphabet, partly due to rendering less well on screen, uh, and also its outdated style. It was a throwback to an older time, even when it was designed in 1901. But let's stop and take a look at this group as a whole. So what we can see broadly with this group is they're all made with a printing technique called letterpress. This is a method of printing in which a raised ink plate is pressed into the printing surface, leaving a debossed impression. Very similar to how pressing the stamp into a piece of bread leaves a recessed impression. 
How deep the deboss effect is depends on the force of which uh, the prince applied and the qualities of the cardstock, its thickness, weight, bulk, and rigidity. Bateman's card gives us the clearest picture of the effect uh, in this shot, but we also can see the impression it leaves on the reverse side of the card on Alan's card in this shot. This is something I can speak to personally, having worked for many years with letterpress cards and prints, though not of the business correspondence variety. Uh, Van Patten's card is the outlier since it's never seen isolated in close-up. It's hard to see whether that deboss effect is there. Also, the cardstock is the most heavily textured of the group, so it may not have much give left in the fibers uh, for the recessed impression. The cards all feature a liberal use of small caps with copper plate gothic. There isn't really an option, but for the others that's a deliberate affect. It's a typographic technique pretty rare to see these days, partly because it's quite poor for legibility compared to lowercase, but also because there was no way of typesetting in true small caps on the web until relatively recently, so it fell out of use in corporate branding as it was difficult to maintain consistency across print and online. The layout of the cards is fairly unremarkable. All four follow the same template, except Paul Allen's card adds a line break between the address and fax number. The hierarchy of information uh, is fine. The eye goes first to the name and uh, title. The secondary info is the company name and phone number. And thirdly, the other contact details. But at the heart of it, the biggest problem with this scene is that the entire premise is fundamentally flawed. Wait, um, stop. Pierce and Pierce is meant to be an investment bank, a la Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. We never actually see anyone doing real work in the film, and we never even see a sign for the corporate office, so it's all extremely vague. What is clear, though, is that any Wall Street bank worth its salt would have a very strictly enforced and probably quite expensive corporate identity that would extend to include business cards. In reality, all these jerks would have the exact same card except for the name on it. In fact, when we look at the cards, they don't even have different contact details. The phone number, fax, and telex all match each other anyway. Because of this scene and the fact that we never see any corporate signage, there is no canonical logo for Pierce and Pierce. There are at least four conflicting versions. Now, it's possible that in the 80s, Wall Street bankers were free from basic things like corporate brand guidelines for stationery and would all regularly go down to the print shop to source their stationery from scratch. Certainly, American Psycho displays greater transgressions than breaking the rules of the style guide, uh, but... I don't know anyone who worked on Wall Street in the 80s, so that is impossible to verify. But also, the author couldn't even name a real font. I highly doubt he did extensive research into the inner workings of corporate stationary logistics within the banking industry. Even at a stretch, if it was the case back then, it certainly isn't so today. Major banks are major brands, and you don't go and print your own damn business cards. Of course, I understand that in movies, realism sometimes takes a backseat to storytelling. Are these great cards worth all of this drama? No, they're mediocre at best, but it doesn't really matter. This scene, for all it gets wrong about card design, it gets everything right about telling the story of these characters, their motivations and their relationships. Plus, who could deny a scene that gave us a Broadway musical number about business cards. The letter ring from Molly in the stock, it's eggshell white. I hope you enjoyed this little reaction video. Maybe you learned a thing or two along the way. If you want to see more content like this, please do me a favor and click some of those YouTube buttons. It's like uh, telling the algorithm good things about me. For a new YouTube channel trying to get off the ground, these things really matter and I greatly appreciate it. Let me know in the comments if you can think of another scene from pop culture that's focused on fonts or design that you'd like to see me address. I feel like... American Psycho must be the most iconic, but I'm always interested to hear your suggestions. My name is Linus, I've been ranting about business cards, and I hope I'll see you in a future video.